very rich people, even they are super rich, due to ideology, if they are not physically going outside to harm others, doing be engaged into terrorist activities or other, they are willing to finance them. Mm -hmm. So it means both the classes, even the poor class as well as rich class, they are equally vulnerable. Hi everyone, before we start, I want to take a minute to talk about my next book. You may have heard about the story of GameStop in January or February and thought it was all over. You're sadly mistaken. Unfolding Online has been a clash between the corrupt practices of Wall Street and the hive mind of the internet. It's a hot, raging information war pitting retail investors against financial giants swimming in corruption and fraud. The trailer is at the end of this podcast, but if you want to help crowdfund the book or just find out more, you can sign up to my mailing list to get access to a preview of chapter one or go to whenmoon.com to read more about the book. The first 200 people to pre-order the book will get a free pack of To The Moon crayons with their book. I just want to make a quick mention of our sponsors. Namecheap are one of the cheapest places on the internet to get a domain name for your next website. I've used Namecheap for all the sites I've ever purchased and I've found it really easy to use. Spreaker are a rapidly growing platform for podcast recording, publishing, and monetization with pricing plans as low as $7 per month. A cheap way to host your podcast and start earning from your back catalog of shows. Finally, ExpressVPN is the internet's most trusted VPN. Protect your privacy and watch and view content that is location locked you could even try watching Netflix from a different country. And right now, they're offering 35% off 12 months of ExpressVPN. Please use the links in the description below if you want to support the show. Anyway, here's the podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of Chatter. Today, I am here with Dr. Wis uh, Rizwan Nasir, an independent strategic security analyst. Um, and we're here to talk all about information warfare. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you very much, Josh, for having me. No problem. So, um, do you want to tell us a little bit about what information warfare is and maybe how it's evolved over the past 20 years? Um, well, if we look at information warfare, it's a very vague term. And uh, still many people uh, who are even experiencing it, they are not killer about it because it's very vast area as well. As we are just living in an information age, we are having information revolution, and everything that is due to globalization is interconnected. The distances are just shrink to a small area. We are so connected with each other. Even when we are connected, it brings so many challenges for us. The information we are exchanging, this information is vulnerable to be intercepted by some of the elements who are not friendly with you. It may be a state or it may be a non-state actor, I mean, some terrorist groups. So when they intercept, your security is at risk. And whatever you're exchanging, if it is very crucial information, some strategic information, that is going to harm your interest. If you're a state, your national interest is at stake. So in information age, as we are living in the age of internet, even we are so much moved, we are so much uh, influenced by this information that we are receiving, or we are sending, if we are receiving the correct, a, correct information that we want, and if we are not getting that information, which is called misinformation or disinformation, it is actually changing our mind, our ideas, and it is distracting us from the right direction to the wrong direction. And the most vulnerable is our youth, the young people who are easily distracted by the straight path or the wrong path. And that is how the terrorist groups, they are actually capitalizing this thing and they're recruiting even online. So there are many other implications for this as well. So information war is a new war, it's a new domain. Uh, fortunately, some of the countries, they have actually find it as a domain of war, whereas other countries are just relaxed, they're not paying attention, but it needs an, an urgency that it should be responded properly. And uh, as we are talking now, and uh, we are talking on this topic just to aware the people how serious this matter is, not only for states, 
for individuals as well. So uh, information war, I wrote a little bit about like sort of um, psychological operations and information war in my in my first book um, that was about, about Brexit. And uh, I went the whole way back to talking about how even uh, Genghis Khan would get his soldiers to um, light three torches at night so it looked like the army was bigger. Um, and they used these great little contraptions that they had hanging off the back of horses to create like loads of dust to make it look like there was more soldiers than, than there really are. So it's, it's not like a, a new idea to try and um, yeah, present what looks like something true on the surface. Uh, but, you know, when you look behind the curtain, then it's, it's something completely false. Um, have you seen any nation that has dealt with um, the, the kind of you know, the misinformation, disinformation that, that you mentioned there in an effective way? Um, because I, I can't get my head around a, an, I, a way in which, because obviously like, you don't want people seeing the wrong, wrong information. As you mentioned, there's very, very, can be very, very bad. It can be used by terrorist groups. But my biggest problem is that I don't think censorship is a good idea. I never think it's a good idea. And so I can't, I can't figure out how we balance, like trying to figure out like, what information should be out there and attempting to like not shut down the wrong people, basically. Uh, well, Josh, um, I, I just, I agree with you. Actually, you are saying uh, censorship is not a good idea. Uh, we should look at the countries uh, like China has not opened up to the rest of the world. Chinese, they have their indigenous system, their own Internet. They, they have their own social media. They, it means they are living in this global world, but they are not that connected as we are connected. The access to the information, the access to the knowledge that is available, uh, especially online. Now, coming back to your point, still um, you mentioned before, Psychological operations, you know, psychological operations, you said this is not new. True, it's not new, but it is in a new form as well. Genghis Khan needed a lot of people to convince them to come to his army and he could actually lure and attract them through uh, the, the, the incentives he could offer them. But in today's world, when we see people who are some kind of ideological and that ideology, that is enough for them to join any terrorist group. And such people are misled by mostly misinformation and propaganda that terrorist groups are. And despite spending trillions of dollars in Afghanistan, America is still facing this problem. The jihadists are not ending. They are still there. How is it happening? They are just using social media. They are spreading their message very smartly. Even they are scaring people through their barbaric videos. Now, uh, the, the psych, psych, psyops, they, this is an action. Now, coming back to this, which country has handled it very, very efficiently? I would like to say America is working very well on it, but America also changes challenges from rest of the world. So one country versus rest of the world, that is a big domain and a big challenge because America realized this threat back in when um, President Bush Sr., 1990, who was he issued an executive order. Later on, it was followed by uh, President Clinton, in 1996, he issued another executive order just to handle the information warfare. So given that, when they realized back before 9-11, they had realized this kind of challenge will be emanating in the future as well. So to deal with them, they had discussions, they had debates about it. Now, the main thing I would like to say what has changed now, uh, you, you give an example of Genghis Khan, but today, army to army is not an, an issue. An army versus a terrorist group or non-state actors, that's an issue. The character of war is changed than before. Now you can inflict so much damage by li living thousands of miles away and you are anonymous. You are not known to anyone. You are behind this. And the, this is possible due to cyber attacks. I would like to say that in this age where we are so much vulnerable to information war, we should take it very seriously. And it's not impacting only one thing that our lives it's impacting our generations as well, who are just bringing new mess. A child goes to school. I don't know. He's or she's connected with some of the group people, the chit chat. And when she comes back and talks to you, oh, these guys are so innocent. We should be with them. 
that's a challenge. And this is how smartly they are putting the narrative through this kind of information that you are saying this, this is disinformation. And as it is rapidly spreading as fire in the forest. So do you think that we're in just like a constant information war now like in our day-to-day -day lives just all the time is that like are we are we just kind of i don't know are we just constantly sitting as sort of individuals like in a crossfire between 20 30 different groups all trying to um put their narrative out there is, is that like the reality of our modern world now uh well josh it depends it depends where you are living in my viewpoint, the people living in liberal democracies, for them, economy is more important. A person living in Africa, he's more concerned about his job, his loaf and bread. A person living in Pakistan, where I belong to, there are many people, they are more concerned about their ideology. The ideology should reach out to as many as possible. You said, are we in a constant? In that case, a person living in democracies or liberal democracies, they are just busy with their daily routines, whereas on the other side, where there are some deprivations as well, poor governance, least regulations by the government on internet, etc. Such people, yes, they are in constant information warfare because they are facing challenges. They are trying to spread their message. And I, I, let me tell you honestly, I receive sometimes messages, anonymous messages on my phone, and I don't like them. I block them. So this is how the, the message is unwanted messages they are reaching out to the millions millions of people and that is how i can say we are kind of in a constant information war which is not so intensified yet but it may intensify where people of different school of thoughts are living together they have different ideologies and ideologies are clashing with each other and you know that two countries they are friendly with pakistan iran from it has shia uh, government Saudi Arabia, it has the Obandi government. So this kind of even the people who are affiliated with these governments, their ideologies, they are so much into it that even I would like to cite you one more example. The people, the veterans who served in Iraq during this two, after 2003 invasion of United States, they came here to clear this uh, Iraq from weapons of mass destruction and removing Saddam Hussein. And after serving five years, the, the man goes back to states and says, I have learned nothing about Iraq, but it is deeply divided into different factions. And the major faction is Sunni and Shia, and the fight is going on for nothing. So this kind of things, this kind of domains, maybe a person living in UK, a person living in America, it's not so important for the people living here. It's a matter of life and death for them. And you can imagine how much effort they're putting for it. And I would like to add one more thing, Josh, funding, funding for such things. You know, if I go outside and I ask uh, someone, this is my project, I really want to work for humanity, I won't find any person who can fund it. It will be very hard for me, even an entrepreneur, any businessman, or any religious clergyman, they won't support me. If a person goes outside and says, this is my religious ideology, this is my ethnic ideology, this is my subnational ideology, you will find hundreds of people standing behind you, okay, I'm willing to fund you. This is irony this is i i don't understand how is it happening so this is the power of funding the people fund you and the motto continues what they want to spread it continues and they are not even um, they're scattered all around uh, from south africa to russia from pakistan to united states canada to argentina they all are scattered but they are well connected mm. due to the technology That's a really interesting point you've made there about the funding um, and you're you're a hundred percent right because I don't know even in the UK we have this this happening where uh, for example oh I'm gonna pick on on Owen Jones actually he's a he's a, he's a left wing um, activist journalist um, sort of person and he is yeah he gets funded by you know people contribute to his Patreon or whatever um, uh, site he uses and he's quite ideologically like rigid so it's quite far left which is fine but um the reason that he is able to you know garner so much support is because of the ideology that he's he's uh, putting forward and if he steps like beyond 
like the board, the binds of his ideology is immediately jumped on by people um, from his own side. So it's it's like the the crowd funds you and then expects you to follow the ideology that you have you know espoused. And if you step outside that, they feel like betrayed because they they're bought in and contributed to your yeah your your way of thinking. It's, uh, yeah, it's fascinating. So, um, one of the things that, that I, I kind of get... Uh, again, Josh, um, I'm not I would sure. like to add one thing. As you were saying, I had an experience uh, living in the uh, UK. I was doing my postdoctorate. I noticed one thing, the youth living over there, especially the youth who is uh, from uh, their roots, from Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Arab countries, uh, majority of them Muslims living there. They practice religion at home. They go there outside. So that's totally different what they are at home, what they are at school. So what happens? These, I have personally, this is my personal observation. These people are more vulnerable as what is taught to them by parents. Just avoid this and that. Don't mix up with the people. They are living in, in a dungeon which, which is imaginative around them and they're not so much mixing. I want to say that that is leading to extremism. And that is why I have read, even followed some of the media, extremist attacks are rising within UK. Uh, th that is how even now social media comes in, information flow of information comes in, where they, such people are more pro prone. And there are instances where I, I have found out the Islamic State of Syria and Iraq, we call Islamic State in short, it has recruited some of the people from these countries. So th this becomes a fertile land for them. They can easily get their people. They can get fun. As you were just mentioning, when a journalist, yeah. this is so unfortunate about it. And if we have this kind of mechanism, it is also possible to AI. Americans, uh, they have caught so many people who are planning attacks, uh, uh, who were having just conversation through social media. So there are many benefits as well, but those benefits are outnumbered by the challenges. One of the things that I have been kind of trying to wrestle with is the extent to which like this information war affects young people. Because so during the, the Trump and Brexit campaigns that, that I wrote about in my book, they uh, there was a lot of talk about how this was old people who had no idea how, how to deal with the internet, how, you know, that, that they just read things and believed they were true because they were on the internet um, about you know, a multitude of different things. Um, Turkey joining the EU or just stuff like that. Um, or um, how, you know, Hillary was secretly going to prison or um, <laughs> things like that, right? And I've, I've been trying to figure out the extent to which young people are less susceptible to this kind of information war because they're so bathed in the internet and just not knowing who to trust and that therefore their minds have become like hyper skeptical um but then i mean i guess you're kind of suggesting that you don't think that's the case so um yeah to, do, do you, what, to what extent do you think young people are kind of in, in, not immune that's a bad word to use these days <laughs> Uh, like in, impervious to this kind of information kind of in a way that perhaps people who weren't like so bathed in the internet would be? Uh, well, uh, Josh, uh, if we look at the state to state level, yeah, states, they have their own policies and states, they have their own interests and agendas to put forward. And uh, when it comes to state versus non-state actors, then the youth groups, the young people of any generation, they are vulnerable, but how much vulnerable they are, we have to see into this. And I just told you that uh, so much flow of information, so much disinformation and misinformation is around. We need to tell our youth that don't rely on the information. Every information you receive on your gadgets, on your phone, verify the sources. Mm -hmm. Being like uh, I have some audience whom I address um, almost every day. And when I talk to them, I say whatever news is coming to me just to verify where it is coming from because there is so much false information and we we have told them any website which is uh, the government website you can easily recognize dot .gov dot any country dot uk um, usa 
you can easily recognize. On the other side, some of the organizations, they have uh, the websites with the name .org or some newspaper which are leading newspaper and like BBC is not even compromising on its repute, CNN is not compromising. They, these are the big channels. They don't compromise on the repute and that is why we can rely on them, but not even so much. Still, they can also throw some um, wrong news and then they apologize later. Imagine how much we are. And I would like to say one thing more. Unfortunately, living here, I, I would see India is in a neighborhood since 1947. We have so much trouble. We went to war 1965, then 71, again 99. We got the nuclear weapons as well. What is happening? The information warfare is at the full swing. Um, India established 200 plus channels, websites, and etc. with the small names, just sending out to the messages to the people that Pakistan is doing this. There are, so Pakistani government is different from the, what is happening in Pakistan. Pakistan is also fighting a war against terrorism as the United States did in Afghanistan and Iraq and Libya. We are doing the same here. Government is different from, but they were maligning the government and you know what happened. Some of the friends from Europe, from USA, UK, they were saying, oh, your government is doing this and that. I said, oh, you're also caught by such kind of news. Don't trust. I'm living here for the last many years. I go all over the world. I see people, interact with the people. How the opinions are made and shaped. So we need to, then this was actually exposed by EU Disinfo Lab. They said it was all propaganda. And then people were so alarmed. Oh, my God. We were reading these newspapers. This is just a single example. I would like to say uh, the great powers, China may be in the race, Russia may be in the race with the US, UK, USA, every state has their own interest. We people who are living in the states, we just believe what state wants us to believe. So now the youth living in country, they will be like we are raised. Uh, Josh, I would like to say, do you believe in social construction? When we are born in family, we adopt the same norms, same principles, same faith, and same kind of things. Uh, because kind of, kind of, of course, it affects our mind and it, it affects our, because we are uh, being raised in that environment. So when it is happening, we are raised with certain beliefs. And when we are raised, we, someone who is born in a religious family, he will be inclined to religious people. Someone who is born in a liberal family. with the, So I would like to say there is a natural clash between these two. Religion is misinterpreted some people. I would like to say there has been much more written, talked, discussed about religion things. But I would like to say almost all the religion, all the world, advocate the same thing that is morality that comes first for everything. Humanity comes first for everything. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, this misinformation is telling the Taliban, first comes the Islamic terrorism, that, you know, that they attack the word Islam with the terrorism. And that is how these all also trick by, I would like to say, then what happened in the broader stage? People reacted, and I want to tell you this is very clear. This is very credible information. Because of the reaction, they said, this is a very organized, smart, sophisticated propaganda against our religion. So they said, okay, if they are doing propaganda against our religion, we're going to do the same as they expect from. There, there was a backlash of that thing. This, this is what I tell you. So I want to tell you this information. Um, we are living information, misinformation. Youth is more, more sentimental. You were mentioning some of the old age people. They're not so energetic. That is a very crucial age when the kids, they become adolescent, they enter the youth, uh, they become a bit mature. They're more sentimental, more power and energy. But at the same time, there comes a responsibility as well to protect them. The responsibility starts at home. It goes to school. Teachers also play a role. Then above all, the government, which regulates this kind of things, because everyone has phones, everyone has smartphones, they are connected online, they have rest of the world to explore. So if governments, they have smart mechanism to filter out such of the things where they can avoid their citizens from misinformation or disinformation or propaganda against state, against humanity, based on religion, based on any ethnic uh, orientation, based on any other orientation, states can play a very pivotal role, what I believe. And I would like to say I've been to UK. UK is doing really a great job. I have to admit it here because I was interacting with many people, but I'm not saying it's so much 
um, uh, impressive uh, uh, mechanism by the UK, but compared to the other countries, it still is doing a really a great job. In, in what specifically are we doing a good job? All right. Uh, let me tell you, uh, before, uh, in the previous uh, talk, I was talking uh, some of the people, some of the Muslim uh, families who are even from Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Saudi Asia, I mean, whole mm -hmm. uh, Arab countries, their youth is there. Their youth, when they are home, they are going to school. There is a complete 180 degree difference. They stay home. They practice what the parents ask them to. When they go to school, they have to live in that environment where they will be interacting with other kids who are maybe non-Muslims from any religions. So what happens in that kind of environment, what is happening to them, they are asked honestly, uh, this is my personal um, experience as well, they ask not to mix up with these people so much. They are citizens of your country and the citizens themselves, their parents are asking, don't mix up with these people. The, you have your own values. Your values are this and that better or this kind of thing. They, this kind of youth, don't you think so? They are vulnerable to more extremism. They are more reactionary. But but I, in that specific way, your government is still doing a great job uh, countering violent extremism, even through media, even through their workshops that I, I, I have seen personally. I'm also really um, sitting here in Pakistan. I published on some research paper on countering violent extremism leading to terrorism. I, research, I published research paper I'm working on. Even I could offer something to my country first, then to other countries, I would be able to, especially where Muslim youth is living. So that is more vulnerable through misinformation. Anything comes, do you know? Let me tell you what a propaganda. I know some of the pictures which are really um, triggering picture, innocent people, very small children, infants. They show their dead bodies and they say, look at that. What this state is doing, atrocities are taking place. Even infants are being killed. And nobody says where this information is coming from. The youth says, oh, my God, these great powers talk about spreading democracy just in the name of their own interests. And you will see that reaction. There will be suiciders available. There will be the people who will be ready to take revenge just in the name of religion, ideology. That is the thing. I personally believe at the state level, the state should work together because this is a common threat not only for Pakistan, for America, for UK, for Europeans, for India, for any country. Terrorism is a common threat for all of us. If we commonly devise a mechanism, now I told you that this is totally shifted. We are not interacting. You don't know me. This is how one person who wants to fund another person, his illegal activity, they say, okay, I send you funds and you go and perform this and you will be rewarded. And this is what is happening today. Uh, they, even drug syndicates, organized crime, they have established their credibility. They're working through social media, through online, smart technology is being used. So this is how information warfare has entered into another phase. And I'm fearful it is like to, likely to intensify in the next five years as states are sending more and more satellites into this outer space. And weaponization and militarization of the outer space is taking place new challenges that are yet to come. Yeah, I want to get onto space here, but uh, I'm curious, actually, so uh, the, the way you're, you're talking, um, it sounds like you, you're suggesting that, I don't know, people being in poverty or sort of feeling trapped in whatever place they are, feeling, um, I don't know, maybe depressed or just um, unhappy with their lives, that that is leaving them vulnerable to the kind of um, information warfare that, that we've talked about and to the, the exploitation by terrorist groups. So um, do you, does that... Just sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Uh, you just said uh, the people in poverty or they're uh, desperate. No, I want to say they are more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. They are more vulnerable. But at the same time, very rich people, even they are super rich, due to ideology, if they are not physically going outside to harm others, to be engaged into terrorist activities or other, they are willing to finance them. Mm -hmm. So it means both the classes, even the poor class as well as rich class, they are equally vulnerable. One is just physically going for sake of money or incentives or some ideological reward, which is just 
or she is aspiring to get in future mm. the one who is just willing to finance i have a lot of money what would i do okay i have a cause that is the noble cause so i'll be financing you so both the groups extremist groups they are more equally vulnerable but the poverty that is just um, it's more kind of a place where people are desperate they they don't have any aim in life because life is for them maybe they prefer that if they go outside and do some kind of thing mm. the it's better than the life they are living today uh, that is what i wanted to say mm. so do you think that there's like the, the, the like a, a a middle class like not quite the middle class but like a, a middle class of people who are not wealthy enough to have the money to throw an ideology but not in like such dire circumstances that they need the money that they need to do whatever people are offering in order to earn the money that they're like the least vulnerable to this or they're the least i don't know ideologically possessed or uh or okay that, would, would you say that's uh, accurate or, or not uh josh um i would like to say in to your uh, this question's response middle class is the most working class and most contributing class in any country even your country america my country they are busy from morning till evening they are earning their bread and butter when they are out of this they may also be vulnerable as the information flow is going but i want to say that more time they are busy with their work their aims and objectives they want to raise their kids well they want to feed their kid, kids well clothe their kids well at the same time they they are actually hoping for a better life and that hope is keeping them in a right direction but i'm not saying they are not distracted they may also be distracted because ideology where ideology comes in you don't you think so the country united states very technologically advanced country very well educated people sitting in the pentagon in the in the state department they are just saying oh there is a threat from communism ideology is this powerful and they just start pumping resources manhattan project the bomb nuclear weapons are made took a lot of amount of money a lot of effort and carefulness as well because there could be a nuclear accident as well so this kind of things even very well educated people very reasonable people when ideology comes in they are never behind they are at the at the front and they are going forward for uh, fighting that ideological war and america has won that over soviet union mm. another is just in the offing with the china mm. that that you can see around the world what is happening where our newspaper whether washington post uh, guardian is publishing or even the atlantic magazine foreign policy magazine foreign affairs magazine by council on foreign relations whatever you see you will find china threat theory china threat theory on the other hand chinese would say we will defend ourselves at every cost even the 100th anniversary of chinese um uh, communist party the chinese leadership very categorically said whoever tries to encroach upon us tries to force us we will be pushing them against the wall the wall that they, they cannot even believe this is the message he sent so this war is intensifying gradually as china is getting more powerful and let me tell you as the more and more resources they are spending uh, this all is possible due to information warfare because i want to tell you i would like to say the communication has become more smarter more strategic because you are spreading your message in 5 seconds 10 seconds now people do not go for watching one hour video two hour videos that the someone is doing message but chinese tiktok how quickly it got vibrance got popularity even it was quickly adopted by the people living in america mm. uk pakistan all over the world mm. because only 17 seconds message then they reduced you have a choice to reduce to uh 10 seconds or maximum you can record your message for 1 minute imagine this is another trick psychologically you are traveling in a tram or subway you are just have you don't have much time but more right you can enjoy in 1 minute 17 seconds more videos to enjoy in this is a very smart trick or more strategic way of conveying your message mm -hmm. so this strategic communication uh is also a very smart tool for conveying your message in a short span of time mm -hmm. Do you think America were right to try and ban it? Pardon? Uh, uh, yeah. Um, so, like, Trump had tried to ban TikTok at one point. Do you think that was like a good move? Um, 
uh, Josh, actually, um, I personally uh, believe it is not a good move. Okay. Uh, if uh, a country which is a champion of democracy, uh, a country which came to Afghanistan to remove uh, the uh, odious regime of Taliban, mm -hmm. then went to Iraq to dethrone the tyrant Saddam, then went to Libya in the name of spreading democracy and removed Gaddafi from there, then Assad regime in Syria, a country which is trying to do so much for the rest of the world is against um, authoritarian regimes against it is doing so much for the humanity as well but at the same time it has a censorship in his country this is i what i call stopping people from using yes america may be at war with china but there should be another way tiktok uh, banning tiktok was not a smart move by the president um, donald trump uh, anything could be expected from him uh, because uh, <laughs> <laughs> because he was a person who was hearing, listening to his mind and heart. <laughs> what, what comes to his mind, he is willing to do no matter is it reasonably good or not, he was doing it. So uh, on the other side, uh, the 5G was a main problem actually, mm. 5G technology, which is more revolutionary. The, the Chinese could uh, capture all the European market. Uh, with their internet, people were appreciating it. Mm. And uh, that was actually alarming for the United States that if uh, 5G, they are more advanced in internet technology. Uh, the more faster internet, the more speed, the more uh, kind of um, uh, this uh, uh, influence they could exercise in the world. That is a problem. Where it, they could find another excuse to do it because states do it. The states, uh, they make excuse for doing anything. But I want to say it was not a good move by the Donald Trump because uh, many Americans who are really rational, they could think, oh, why did he do it? They were actually enjoying making videos on on their uh, TikTok. Maybe I don't know you tried it or not. I tried several times. Uh, it's a cool try, app. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, like, uh, I don't anyways, like the data harvesting. It's like the most um, predatory app and one of the most predatory for like all the data it takes. And I've been trying to uh, to cut down the amount of you know, social media apps that I'm on. They're all I completely deleted Facebook and Instagram. Um, I don't have any of the apps on my phone anymore, um, just because. Yeah, I just and TikTok was the yeah. I read a piece about how about how much data it's trying to harvest. So, Josh, uh, I think you have heard to your friend Edward Snowden who fled to Russia, and he was saying, "Please, NSA is watching you. Whatever you are doing." The, the espionage and uh, they were actually uh, screening phones of people. The information was intercepted. Even, uh, you know, the Angela Merkel, the German chancellor, her phones were uh, taped. Uh, her information was intercepted. Yeah. So I appreciate as you are so much careful, we should be careful sometimes the information leaks out. <laughs> we stand nowhere. We say, oh, giving access to oh, my personal information. It's on internet, online, YouTube, mm -hmm. anywhere. So you are right. Um, some of the time, uh, these kind of apps, they may be predatory and uh, we should be very careful while agreeing to the terms and conditions that, okay, I agree to uh, allow your access to my pictures, my cam, my memory, mm. everything. This kind of things, yes, um, this is another aspect. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I'm, I'm aware that like a lot of the conversations I'm having with people at the minute are not popular amongst powerful people sometimes i mean i've just had um uh i've just oh, i'm about to have this uh girl kirby summers on who wrote a book about jeffrey epstein and disney maxwell um there was a girl who had, i had on yesterday talking about the the war in um israel palestine so i'm just yeah, trying to be a little bit careful but but um yeah I, i'm not as open to, you know I'm sure there's definitely ways to like access my stuff if you really want it, but you know, I try to make it not easy, basically. <laughs> um, so you, you kind of mentioned um, the outer space and the, the amount of satellites that we're, we're sort of sending up more and more and more and more. Um, does how much does that make nations vulnerable? So, for example, if um, Elon Musk and, and SpaceX are putting up their their Starlink. Um, network of satellites and that is uh, going to provide internet around the world and you know they're not alone there's loads of um, countries putting up more and more satellites how much more vulnerable do you think that makes um, individual nations or like humanity as a whole to 
yeah, attacks from from either states themselves or just um, bad non-state actors. All right, um, Josh, I already mentioned um, the Elon Musk is putting satellites in under the name of Starlink, providing internet connectivity to the rest of the world. It's really a great job. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the military use of the satellites or military use of uh, the technology, then states are alert to this kind of use. And uh, you know that parallel, there is Chinese uh, who are Tencent uh, internet giant, then Alibaba, they are also putting satellites into the space, outer space. Uh, given this kind of situation, the satellites or the internet, which are under the American government or America owns them, Chinese don't own them. And Chinese, if they feel threat, they in future, or they already have tested by the way in 2005, then 2007, anti-satellite tests, they can hunt any satellite and after that they can destroy it as well because they, they tested it in, in 2007 by destroying a satellite, a weather satellite which was, which was redundant. But what happened? It also left some debris, about 3,000 small pieces of debris in the outer space. Mm -hmm. And Josh, it's very interesting to know the whole modern life, not only these two countries are at uh, cross purposes or they have their own respective strategic designs. The Kessler syndrome is that in space, something is spinning mm -hmm. or revolving around the earth. You cannot stop it. You cannot stop it if there is a collision or there is an accident, even one accident with the other satellite, it can deviate its direction from the uh, from the proper course where it was spinning around. So what will happen? It will destroy all of the humanity's modern life. This this is a fear because all this kind of debris is a, really a great challenge. Now coming to this uh, point. SpaceX is giving internet, which is more faster, more reliable. This is really good. But the civilian use is appreciable, logical. When it comes to the military use of the internet, that creates trouble. Then states are really alert to that. They are their own. Uh, and I would like to say one more thing. Uh, Max Boot, who is a um, um, strategic analyst as well uh, with the US government, he was uh, teaching, he's a professor as well. He said, the modern American government, modern American military, it has a military prowess. It has technological advantage over other countries. And if someone wants to defeat the American military, it is only possible through blinding them. Just they do not have access to their technology. They do not have, because if you fail them to have the communication from the satellite they are receiving, their all modern equipment is connected with that, they may lose the war against any adversity. And let me tell you, this is going to be possible in near future because such an attack, you, you can have uh, the satellite radiations you can send, you can jam the communication from the satellite. And at the same time, this kind of things, they are challenged not for two governments only. I'm concerned about that. This is challenge for the whole humanity. If such great accident in a war or in a tussle happens, we cannot undo it. On the earth, if something is going wrong, something is moving, going out of control, we can stop it. In space, outer space, we cannot stop it. And you know that the intercontinental ballistic missiles, which we have make a projectile, like they go in the outer space, then they come back. Even destroying the satellite assets or communication assets, that still is possible by the states. Uh, for that, I would like to recommend one thing. Diplomacy is the best way. I have seen when nuclear weapons came, the nuclear weapons were a revolutionary technology. They were weapons of, actually, in the beginning, they were used in the war, Second World War, mm -hmm. and Japan quickly surrendered. Mm -hmm. Seeing its charisma, its power, other countries, they got nuclear weapons. UK got nuclear weapons. Russia already got nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Then China got, then India got, then Pakistan got. nuclear. Mm -hmm. North Korea got. Iran is trying to get the nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. This kind of thing. Similarly, if you imagine what was happening, America and USSR sat together. They started doing diplomacy. Let's talk about the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. Mm. They made agreements about it. Mm. Let's talk about START, Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. Let's reduce that number. Mm. So 
this is a kind of diplomacy which really has uh, impressed people around the world. These two countries, they are enemies to each other, but at the same time, diplomatic channels are open for talking. In the modern age, when we are living, we are having lots of incentives in the modern age. The great, great powers, they have technology, they should sit together. What are the common challenges for both of them? They must talk about the, there should be diplomatic forums where they should be devising a solution that it should not be utilized or capitalized by the non-state actors. Any state, maybe states are rational actors. States don't go that the way that they can kill 100 people or 1,000 people without any compunction. These are the jihadis, so-called, the, this the kind of terrorist organization who are willing to do th this kind of thing. They, If they find this kind of uh, technology in their hands, because um, if you have heard the black market during after the disintegration of USSR in 1991, many nuclear scientists who were living in Central Asia, Central Asian states, today Central Asian states, then USSR, Ukraine, Poland, there were some nuclear scientists, they had made a syndicate which was linked to the black market. They were willing to sell weapons, weapon design, this kind of things. Even today, there are many scientists out there who are for sale. Any, any terrorist organization having fun can buy their services. Mm. They will be willing to harm not only America or UK or European Union or Pakistan, India. They are willing to harm whole humanity. So I, I personally believe that the, the states, the governments should take up role here. I understand they have differences and those differences are very natural. We humans are made this way. By default, we are like this. But we are also rational. Mm. If uh, we fight, we also cooperate. You understand, I, I, I think uh, we should be more serious about uh, negotiations and diplomacy and finding a solution to this common problem, common challenge. Do you, do you buy the, the, the concept of mutually assured destruction? Um, do you think that's well, the reason we, because I don't know, uh, I saw oh, no, a tweet uh, this morning from like a, a UK politician who, uh, Richard Virgin, who's the, uh, yeah, he's tipped to maybe be a future leader of, of the Labour Party, uh, like our, one of our biggest parties. And he was saying, you know, we need to get rid of all nuclear weapons. And like, I, I love the idealism, the idealism, but then I kind of feel like mutually assured destruction has meant that no one has used the bombs. Since, okay, you know, America dropped it on Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki and killed 200,000 people, uh, innocent people. But since we've seen the destructive power of that, no one has used them, despite um, some of like the most volatile states um, in the world having maybe nuclear weapons, um, maybe Iran soon. Um, North Korea have maybe got something. Um, there's, there's no, yeah, you know, Russia and America were at each other's throats the whole way through the Cold War. Even in the Cuban Missile Crisis, like we managed to avoid blowing, blowing each other up because, yeah, they were just too scared of the consequences. You know, no one, no one wants to be king of the radioactive ashes of, of humanity. <laughs> yeah, true, true. Okay, you said, uh, do I buy the um, concept of mutual assured destruction? Uh, let me tell you one thing. Uh, very recently, I don't remember the year, maybe uh, last year or uh, back in 2018 or 19, there was uh, an alarm raised in uh, Hawaii. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. The alarm was like uh, the North Korea has launched nuclear weapons uh, because the North Korean regime is very uncertain and everyone knows about it. Mm -hmm. So when the alarm raised, the people were running and shouting, taking shelter, as they were actually uh, told that if, in case of, because they were doing drills, right? Imagine if this kind of malfunctioning happened to the system and system tells you the message because we are relying on so much technology. We do not analyze the data. The signal comes at, oh, there are two nuclear weapons launched through ICBMs from any country. And any country, whether the United States is all right, the, the weapons have been launched, let's retaliate. Retaliation is natural. So two nuclear weapons, America would not be bearing on it. It will be trying to intercept first and then retaliate, throwing the missiles back on that country, which they already are prepared for any, this kind of uh, danger or this kind of threat. So imagine even this accident, this kind of accident is leading two countries towards an accidental nuclear clash, then 
you you imagine the question you asked this concept of mutually assured destruction it's quite quite possible and uh, i would like as you say you believe in um, this uh, idealism or utopianism i also believe in that i personally believe that we humans why can't we live in peace if we are living in war it means we need to be uh, educated more we need to be more mature about it for me what is more important i should enjoy every facility of life life is not for this that i sacrifice everything for a certain thing i need to enjoy and i want my generations to enjoy those things and every facility every technology all of the incentives that the nature has given us we should be enjoying them now the, there comes a problem incompatibility of regimes you talk of north korea north korea is uncertain mm -hmm. if north korea is uncertain then comes iran as well on the other side iran uh, i appreciate uh, the obama administration who had the john kerry was doing extensive diplomacy mm -hmm. about bringing iran to the terms of uh, like negotiating and okay you uh, leave your nuclear weapons we will be engaging you if you have some economic aid we can give you economic aid come back to the so what happens uh, after signing joint comprehensive plan of action jcpoa then trump administration the moment he came he said i will just revoke this he revoked it i don't know what was in his mind uh, now trump is gone biden administration is once again working on it because i believe what diplomacy can achieve clash can never achieve mm -hmm. and clash leads you to some repent uh, re you repent in the end this should not have happened as has happened in the previous wars the war now it may be global if people say no third world war is possible i say the war is not going to be the third world war is not going to be possible but its magnitude will be equivalent to the third world war due to the nuclear weapons and its destruction so i uh, once again closing my argument about it you said uh, mutually assured destruction he tweeted uh, i would like to say it is quite possible it's not the states who are going to launch deliberately but if the system is compromised then it's quite possible mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Well, um, unfortunately, uh, I'm really enjoying this, but I have to run here because I have another call at half past 12. So um, if you, is there anything you want to point people towards of your work uh, to check out if they're interested? Uh, last of your sentence, I missed it. Sorry, because of the communication. Uh, um, is there any, any of your work that you would like to point people towards to, to check out if they've enjoyed listening? Wow. Okay, thank you very much for asking me. I have uh, published some of the work which is available online. And um, my work is mainly on uh, two, three things. And that is one is uh, peace and stability in South Asia, which is regarding the nuclear weapons, how the nuclear uncertainty, because we call it nuclear flashpoint. They should read how I, I have tried to say that we should be engaged into confidence building measures, and that's the only way out. Another thing is countering violent extremism. I have written about it. I have written about uh, nuclear terrorism, fear of nuclear terrorism. I also wrote about the Pakistan-China relationship and Pakistan-United States relationship. It's about like international relations issues. I'm working on a book soon uh, for your audience and they will be finding about it. And that is about the Pakistan's nuclear weapons, its doctrine and uh, how is it going to add up to the nuclear stability or instability in South Asia? Because we are trying to catch up with India, trying to maintain a balance with India, but things are going out of control sometimes. So I would like to say to the audience, if they really want to read me, I'm available. They can Google my name. They can find my work. And most of them are open access. They can, they can access it. And it was really great talking to you, Josh. Uh, I liked your uh, show. I liked your style. And I will be sharing with my colleagues and my students as well. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you very much, man. Um, I will, yeah, send you links and everything when it's out. But uh, yeah, thanks very much. Once again, thank you very much and a really great time. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the podcast. Don't forget our sponsor, ExpressVPN, and my book, Brexit, The Establishment Civil War, can both be found in the links in the description below. And also, please like, share, and subscribe to this podcast. It's the best way to help us grow. Until next time, thanks for listening.
grew the hedge funds. You can make as many rules as you want, but if there's no teeth behind them, what's the point? Well, like Citadel is potentially just gone in a few months. It feels like financial institutions, that they are all laughing at us by buying GME. <laughs> Screw the hedge funds. Like, I will lose my entire investment if it brings them down. Why on earth, last May, could you buy the entire company for $200 million? What's been happening on Reddit and in social media and in the marketplace has never been seen before. I argue that nothing is off the table. There is nothing off the table when dealing with the volumes of money in something as big as the United States uh, stock market. The hedge funds have clearly underestimated a group of a group of people raised on Friday night World of Warcraft rates. Dark pools, they are they're another uh, mechanism to manipulate and cheat. Mainstream journalists don't say these things for a number of reasons. Uh, one is their sources are the people that I'm talking about, and so they can't call somebody a crook. Super Stonk and the other communities that have emerged are a hive mind, the likes of which we have never seen before. It's madness and brilliance, insanity and genius all rolled into one. It's very possible that Citadel will be gone in a few months. And, and not just Citadel, but the entire financial system has the potential to come crashing down. These crooks continue to gamble recklessly with the world economy, and this could be the moment that they finally get their justice. <laughs>